and available to view in the Council's website. Could I ask IT colleagues to start the recording, please? Yeah, that's the recording started. Okay, Cheryl, can I ask you to call the Cedrant and intimate any apologies, please? Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I'll just run through the Cedrant if you can indicate your attendance, please. Councillor Graham Barton. Yeah, thanks. Councillor John McGee. Yeah. Councillor Ellen Friel. I'm here, thanks, Chair. Councillor Elaine Cowan. Yeah. Councillor Maureen Mackay. Present. Councillor Peter Mabin. Present. Thank you, Cheryl. Councillor Claire Maitland. Here. Councillor William Lennox. Morning, here. Got apologies from Councillor Billy Crawford. Councillor Neil Watts. Uh, present, Cheryl. Councillor Drew Filson. Here. Councillor Jennifer Hogg. I'm here, thank you. Councillor Eileen Stewart. Yep, here, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Cheryl. Members, I've got an update in the order of business for you. Uh, item three has been withdrawn from the agenda as the applicant has asked for time to produce further supporting information, which will be submitted and consulted upon in due course. The item will continue to committee at a later date. Also, there's objectors, objectors present for item six in the agenda and propose to change the order of business to take item six after item four. Members are okay with that? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on to item one the agenda, and that's declarations of interest. I don't see anyone in the room or online. Okay, thank you very much. So move on to item two in the agenda, and that is the hearing procedure. Can I ask Cheryl to take us through that? Thanks, Chair. Page three of your paper highlights the planning hearing procedure. Paragraph one highlights that the Chief Planning Officer or a representative will give details of the application. The objectors will then present their objections to committee in support of their written objections. Each objector will be given five minutes. Then the members of the committee may ask questions of the objectors on their submissions which they have made. And just to note that this is not to be taken as an opportunity to comment on the merits or otherwise of the planning application. Thereafter, the applicant or their agents will speak for a maximum total of 15 minutes. And members of the committee may ask questions of the applicant on their submissions have made. And again, to note that this is not to be taken as an opportunity to comment on the merits or otherwise of the planning application. The hearing will then close and all parties will be asked to withdraw to the public gallery and the committee will consider the application. At this stage, the Chief Planning Officer or representative will address the committee and give appropriate cl clarification on any issues raised during the hearing. Thereafter, the committee will then make a decision. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Cheryl. We're going to move on to item four on the agenda, and that is planning application number 23 oblique 0636 oblique PP. That's formation of electricity substation compound, including access, flood lighting and 2.5 metre fence with bio biodiversity plan at East May Street, Darvel, East Ayrshire, K170JG by SP Energy Networks. And I think, David, you're going to take us through this one. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, the purpose of this report is to present a planning application for determination as it has been subject to more than 10 objections and falls to planning committee under the scheme of delegation. The application site is located within but in the eastern outskirts of Darvel, adjacent to and immediately south of the A71. The land is currently in use for agriculture. The development is for a new electricity substation comprising of various structures set within a compound formed by palisade and acoustic fencing. Access is taken from an existing field access, which will be upgraded, and an area of biodiversity enhancement is to be created to the east of the site. The site and development details are set out at paragraphs 3 to 7 of the papers. Consultation responses are set out at paragraph 10, noting that no consultee is raising an objection subject to the use of appropriate conditions. 13 objections have been received, a summary of which is set out at paragraphs 11 to 13, raising various matters including loss of green space, road safety, location, flooding and noise. Prior to moving on to the assessment of the development, I'll share some details of the development for some visual context. Bear with me, just while I share my screen. This sh uh, sli uh, slide is just showing the site location and context. Uh, members should note that the application boundary shown on the plan at page 38 of your papers is incorrect and reflects the originally proposed plan prior to the inclusion of the biodiversity tree planting area. 
This slide shows the development in the context of the existing substation, which the applicant has advised has been decommissioned, with Darvo placed on an emergency power supply. The applicant has advised that they cannot develop what is required for the replacement substation within their existing substation ownership boundary, and that the original site is also subject to flood risk. You can see the location there of the existing uh, primary substation um, over on the left-hand side of the screen uh, with the proposed development to the right. This is a proposed layout plan uh, showing the structures within the site boundary as well as the planting area to the immediate east. And it's a slightly simpler view showing the layout in the context of the road just to the immediate north the properties to the north of the A71 and the field within which the development sits. This slide shows the development elevations, largely excluding the two and a half metre high fencing around the site, but showing the three metre L-shaped acoustic barrier in the northeastern and eastern boundary. And this slide shows the elevations with the fencing and landscaping, noting that the acoustic barrier and fencing is to be painted in forest green colour. The slide provides some more detail of the proposed planting, primarily consisting of trees to the eastern side of the substation, uh, but also including thickening of the existing hedge row, new hedge on the western, southern and eastern boundary of the fencing, and some wildflower meadow planting on the northern fence line. The slide is an extract from the LDP2 Darvo settlement map, showing that the site is located within the settlement boundary and in land designated as safeguarded open space. And the final slides are some pictures um, taken um, of the site. Um, the first is located just within the site boundary, looking towards the A71 and the existing field gate. Then from the site entrance back towards Darvo, with the remainder of the field visible. And looking towards Priestland. Stop sharing there. Okay, with me. So turning now to the assessment, the key matters of interest are set out from paragraphs 19 to 44, noting that the principle of an electricity substation is supported in LDP2 through policy INF1. The application site is designated as safeguarded open space in LDP2. Policy OS2 advises that there will be a presumption against development in these areas unless policy criteria are satisfied. In this case, the open space is not used for sporting or recreational purposes. It represents a small loss of a wider area, primarily designated for its contribution to the setting of Darvo, and in which on the detail of development is not considered to unacceptably impact on the character and appearance of the area. And finally, sufficient overall open space remains in Darvo. This satisfies the specific policy criterion, and on that basis, the development is considered to be compatible with policy OS2. No unacceptable biodiversity or nature impacts are expected, noting the enhancement measures secured in the additional tree planting area in particular. No noise impact is expected, noting that environmental health raised no objection provided the acoustic barrier is put in place. No flood impacts are expected, noting that SEPA and ARA flooding officers raise no objections. No unacceptable road safety impacts are expected, with ARA raising no objections subject to provision of a construction traffic management plan by planning condition. And there are no unacceptable visual impacts presented noting that the development retains hedge screening, has provided mitigation in the form of tree planting to soften the appearance of the development, and will paint the fencing and barrier green to reduce the visual impact of the originally proposed galvanised metal fencing. As noted within the conclusions at paragraph 45, subject to the imposition of planning conditions, the development is considered to be compliant with the development plan, and other material considerations are generally supportive of the development other than the representations, the detail of which is not considered to be sufficient to outweigh the findings of the development plan. The recommendation is to approve the application subject to planning conditions and detailed wording can be found on pages 35 to 37 of the conditions. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, David. Members, this application is subject to a hearing this morning, so I'd propose that we give five minutes for each objector and 15 minutes for the agent, if we're all in agreement with that. Thank you very much. The yeah, first objector is a Marcus Priceland. Robert, if you could show Marcus.
Mr. Bryson. So when you begin, I'll give you five minutes and I'll, I'll give you a gentle reminder with a minute to go, if that's OK. It's just begin when you're ready. Uh, as a, re a resident living directly across the proposed site, my wife and I potentially the most affected by this development. The impact on our home and daily lives would be significant. We acknowledge the need to upgrade the existing plant. We strongly disagree with the decision to relocate it to this particular location. Several critical concerns remaining un unaddressed, and I'd like to outline them. Noise concerns. We have not received sufficient assurance that noise, noise levels from the proposed site will not negatively impact our property. The planned acoustic barrier, only 1.8 metres high, how can we be certain that sound will not travel above this height? Additionally, the barrier appears to cover only a portion of the site, providing no protection from the, ge the generated by the main unit. Is this correct? Furthermore, the prevailing wind direction could amplify the noise. Has this been considered? When I requested information about visiting a similar system to assess the noise, SP Energy claimed it would be quieter than the existing one. However, I later discovered that the existing system had been decommissioned. This raises serious doubts about the reliability of these assurances. Flooding risks. Part of my property, which is directly across from the proposed site, I noticed it wasn't shown in the images. Uh, the, it's classified high risk on the SEPA, SEPA website. One of the reasons given for relocating the power station is to move away from an area at low risk of flooding. However, the new proposed location is closer to an area with a much higher flood risk. This decision seems both illogical and potentially hazardous. Just yesterday, a significant portion of my drive and this morning was flooded, and this is summer. Road safety. We have major concerns about the safety of ourselves, other road users and pedestrians. As previously highlighted, we live in a very dangerous stretch of road. Over the years, there's been attempts to implement alternative speed restrictions as our stretch of road remains particularly problematic. When pulling out of our driveway, we must often accelerate quickly to avoid being rear-ended by speeding cars that suddenly appear around the blind bend. Currently, we have a long straight section of road to do so. If the proposed site goes ahead, we would have less than 50 metres between pulling out and reaching the new junction. In my opinion, this would be extremely dangerous. Property value. Well, it seems uncomfortable to address the impact and property, pro the impact on property value cannot be ignored. The desirability and demand for a property so adversely affected by such a project will undoubtedly decline. Whether founded or not, many people have health concerns about living near pylons, let alone a substation. Although we do not own the views, the site will have a significant impact on desirability. The potential for flooding, noise and the altered outlook coupled with health concerns will all negatively affect the value, desirability and saleability of our property. Are we compensated for this? Well, these concerns are personal, they also extend to the entire town of Darville. Over the past four, four years, my wife and I have invested considerable time and money into restoring our old home. During this time, Darville itself has undergone remarkable transformation thanks to dedicated effort of organisations like the Community Council, DART and DIG, these groups have been instrumental in revitalising our town, focusing on regeneration projects that benefit the entire community. Hastings Square on East Main Street, for example, has seen significant improvements with more planned. The town halls also set for enhancements. And after a long struggle, the derelict co-op building has been demolished to make way for the corner, a vibrant community hub and performance space. As, a, as you continue along Main Street to the east, you're greeted by rolling hills and what was once a cherished green space. This area, frequently used by dog walkers, runners and those seeking a moment of peace, is now under threat. We regularly see groups of children using the park instead of the pavement where cars speed by dangerously. Now we face the possibility of SP Energy constructing a power station right at the roadside. The first thing people will see when they enter Darvo after a picturesque countryside drive. Instead of being welcomed by serene views of distant hills, sorry to interrupt, but that's a minute left. Visitors will be confronted with an industrial structure detracts from the town's natural beauty. I've raised these objections before, and in fact, I'll just speak to my end. Uh, mm -mm. Finally, I'm perplexed by the latest version of this sub supplementary statement produced in May 2024. In a 30-minute call with uh, SP Energy's planning department in February, I was informed that the relocation was due solely to the landowner's future plans. 
However, there was no mention of alternative sites one, two or three, nor was any mention of potential alternative sites that would have a worse visual impact than the proposed site. This doesn't even make sense. I was categorically, categorically told there was no alternative option other than the site that was directly in front of my house. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Bryson. So at this point, I'll open uh, up to members to see if they've got any questions for you. Yeah. Members? Yeah. Councillor McGee. <coughs> Uh, thanks. Uh, paragraphs uh, 39 and 40, did the noise impact assessment no give you any assurances whatsoever? Uh, uh, I, I actually contacted uh, SP Energy uh, regarding being, being a layman. I don't, I don't understand figures, you know, how, you know, results from... from uh, the assessment, uh, as I said, uh, what what I wanted was to try and get my head. You, you know, this we, it was a bit of a shock to us to find out at such short notice um, that, that this was going ahead. So when I spoke to, uh, 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 as I said, I wanted to understand more. Can I go? There must be another one of these sites I can go and understand the impact it's going to have on my property. And what, you know, can we have windows open? Can we sit in our garden? My wife's uh, a respiratory specialist. She does clinics from home. Will she be able to concentrate on her work? Uh, that, to answer your question, no, I don't understand. I'm, I'm not an expert. Hence why I said, can I have a site where I can go and both look at and hear if there's a buzz, a hum, the noise? Uh, and and I was told to to go and visit the current site, and I found out that that had been decommissioned uh, beforehand. And the other, uh, the other the other they they did say they would get back to me with a site. Uh, uh, they were going to speak to a colleague who was going to be on holiday until the initial deadline. Uh, however, that was in, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting to go and. Uh, find a, a site that I can go and try and understand better. Members, are there any other questions? No, thank you very much. If you could just return to the public gallery, Mr. Okay. Preston, thank you. Thanks. Next objective to speak is a Mr. Kenneth Ringland. Thanks, Mr. Ringland. It's the same again. It's five minutes, and just we gentle reminder at four. Just to so. thank you. I appreciate the the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of concerns. Um, my main concern is regarding the site flooding risk in that area. Uh, I'm reading the supplementary information. Uh, I'm of the opinion that the reasoning that was used for not utilising the existing substation site is flawed for the following reasons. The document states that the existing substation sits near to the SEPA floodplain. The key word here is near. According to SEPA, the site is not at risk of flooding with the closest area that may be at risk in the area of a 0.5% chance in the year category. The site that's been chosen for the new substation is sited across the uh, A71 roadway, directly opposite an area which is designated as having a 10% risk of flooding in any year. In other words, to my mind, we're moving a substation from an area of relatively low risk to one which is 20 times more likely to flood. Whilst I appreciate the existing site has been indicated as not large enough for a new substation, the purchase of a parcel of land to augment this site would certainly resolve that issue. The document also states that the existing site is not suitable for reuse under SPEN's own rules as it sits within five metres of a water course. The site has a water course directly running underneath it, uh, and as so in my mind that that means that the, the uh, SPN EN's own rules negate the use of that site. Uh, that particular water course is shown on a map. It's also, we've actually gone down to look at it as well, it runs from uh, the property directly opposite the gates down underneath that site through into the River Irvine. The second uh, issue I'd like to discuss is the uh, site entrance traffic risk. 
Whilst I appreciate uh, ADA have no concerns on the uh, use of that area uh, and that roadway there, I'm sure that's been based on that being a 30 mile an hour limit. Uh, as a frequent user of that road, both uh, in a car and also walking, I can tell you there's not very many people do 30 mile an hour on that road. Many people leaving Priestland believe they have uh, gone back out into the countryside and put their foot down. Uh, I'd, you know, I haven't done a survey of speed in that area, but I'm estimating probably most cars in that area are doing between 40 and 60 mile an hour. As a result, the risk clearly is different to that would be for a road that's at a 30 mile an hour limit. Cars come round that bit blind bend at excessive speed. Uh, I've seen myself crossing that road to go up the so-called local five mile walk and I've had to end up running across the road to avoid being knocked down. Utilisation of others, a uh, a uh, the, the other options in that area, either options one and two, um, would significantly reduce this risk, I believe, because you've got a long straight stretch of road where you can actually see traffic coming towards you. If we do go ahead with this particular uh, site, I would ask another question, a supplemental question, which is have any provisions been made for the erection of perhaps 30 mile an hour repeater signs or some sort of road markings to remind you uh, road users of the speed limit in that particular area? That's me, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Ringland. Members, do you have any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr Ringland. If you just turn to the, the public gallery. Okay. Yeah. We have one other objector who would like to speak, and that's a Mr Robert Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. Again, it's it's just five minutes, and a general reminder at four minutes needed. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak to you this morning. <clears throat> um, I'm chairman of the local community council, and uh, I was asked by um, Mr. And Mrs. Bryceland to have a wee look at this. Um, I would endorse most of what's been said already. Uh, all of it's been well stretched by, by a number of people. And um, one or two B points I'll make. Um, it's mentioned within the application that one of the reasons for moving the substation to the other end of the field is in case someone wishes to build on this land in the future. And as such, it would be unsightly to have a substation near. Um, you are now putting the same structure in front of a house which is already there, and it seems a bit uh, unfair to the people involved. Indeed, way back in 2006, a planning application was made, 06 oblique 0475 oblique OL, and a decision was made at that time we cannot find any paperwork from that, but the application was then withdrawn. So we must assume from that that the application was declined and that was to build on that particular land. Um, so I think the reason of, um, of uh, not putting the substation up at that end uh, because of building is is a wiped out because it's been it's been declined in the past to my mind. I may be wrong, but it needs to be looked at. Um, one of the, the anecdotally in Darvel, uh, I've lived in Darvel for fifty years now. Um, that land is a floodplain and is unsuitable for building, and that has always been the case. Um, people have always worried about 
water because it comes down off the hills at the sides and it ends up in that field. And I think uh, the lucky they've got away with it where it is. It's, but it's worse along at the east end of the field. Um, again, a lot's been made of the flood risk due to the close proximity to the river. And on studying the maps attached, it would appear there's only about half a metre difference in height over the whole site. So basically you've got, which to my mind is a flat piece of land. And seeing that one end is more liable to flood than the other, I think the, the end that's liable to flood more is where the, the water's coming down off the hills rather than up where it is just now. Um, one would also assume that there is no other development expected which would benefit from the substation being built in this particular location. And uh, that's, that's, that's about me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kerr. So at this point, I'm going to open up to members to see if we get any questions for you. I don't see him do online either. Oh, sorry, Councillor Lennox. Uh, thanks, you. Uh, thanks for your presentation there. Um, just wondering, uh, I may have missed it in the in the papers, but have the community local community council formally uh, put an objection in against this application? We did. It was right at the very last minute, and it doesn't appear to be in the papers. Yeah, thanks. Uh, again, it was because it was it was we were very short a time when we the whole thing was very very uh, short time before we had to get something done. It was between meetings, if you know what I mean. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Carr. I don't see any other questions, so I'll we'll just no. Okay, if you just return to the public gallery, right. gallery yeah. thanks. We're moving on to the procedure where we're going to ask the agent of the application to come up and speak to us, Mr. Wakas Ahmed. Mr. Ahmed, I think we're going to give you 15 minutes. Morning all, how's everyone doing? I uh, hope you can hear me okay. I'm going to give a little bit of a background to the project to help everyone understand why this is taking place. Um, the existing transformer at the existing site has been out of service since July 2022, which was due to an uh, unanticipated but a pretty critical fault to the, to the asset. And right now, the supply from that substation is done via our contingency supplies, as we would call it, backfeeds. So this is really like the kind of last order of supply that the that the community and Davos is currently receiving. The transformer requires replacement, but the existing site is 10 metres from the water course and, and breaches our design policies where it must remain 15 metres clear of any borehole, borehole or wells. The health index of our transformer already was approaching end of life if it wasn't before because it's been installed for over 40 to 50 years. And the existing 11 kV switch gear that we have also at the existing site was also close, is, is classified from its health index is close to end of life. And therefore we've decided a new site location is required to redevelop the substation. Now to answer some of the objections that were listed that we've had a look at, I just want to kind of go through them and try and try and address them as best as I can. Uh, one of the objections was uh, clearing a green space habitat and erosion of river. In order for ourselves to construct this substation safely and adhere to not just our own design compliances, but National Grid's electrical standards, uh, we've carefully calculated the minimum development area required to, to achieve the substation needs. And this obviously results in ground clearance works within a greenfield site, but we've made assurances and proposals that they will be planting up to 30 new trees and additional vegetation planting around the perimeter of the compound. Our, as I mentioned, our policies indicate that no development of a new substation shall be within 10 metres of any water course, and our development area is over 83 metres from the River Urban. 
and we intend not to have any detrimental impact to its current condition. We cannot redevelop the existing within the existing footprint due to the fact that we're breaching the minimum discipline requirements for ourselves, and that would, in our minds, pose a greater environmental hazard in the long term should this be undertaken. Our landscaping proposals we see is quite robust to offset the impact of the development, and we've also noted the proposed conditions regarding the protection of biodiversity, ecology and breeding birds, and are committed to engaging with the Council to ensure that these conditions are met up to the time and, and beyond construction. The objection was made that development is close, in close proximity to the A71. And to be honest, it's common practice for SP Energy Networks to install substations directly off main roads and even built up areas with sufficient space to do so. Whilst we acknowledge that this is a busy A road, we've made provisions to allow for safe visibility, access and egress from the site. Ayrshire Roads Alliance have been consulted as part of the application process and, as, as previously mentioned, did not object to the subject of a, to the provision of a CTMP, which we are committed to providing. We've been told that the site poses a danger to speed and vehicles approach from, approaching from the A71, and that's why we've, we've took that into consideration. We've proposed a Bellmouth access point towards the entrance gate of the site, and we've used visibility space during the design phase to ensure that we've got sufficient vis visibility from either side of the A71. And we also understand that the residents have made claims in the past to reduce the speed limit, and whatever else is required to allow drivers to be aware of the speed limits, we would support this uh, 100%. No prior consult consultation with the local residents. We made contact with the local landowner for a potential new location, and it was himself that suggested this location to ourselves. It was already an access gate available along the hedgerow and was understood to cause the least disruption to the local community. The landowner of the proposed development area has provided full cooperation regarding the substation development. He's agreed with all the proposals up to this point, and we have assumed that he's a local resident of the area. We will be providing updates to, to neighbouring residents well in advance of any construction works or tra traffic management implementations, as these works are considered critical and essential to the electrical infrastructure supply in the Darvo area. And we do pride ourselves on having good relationship with stakeholders. We are aware that our work can be impactful on local communities and for distribution uh, sorry for distribution projects at this scale however we would not normally undertake a formal consultation with the community because there's no statutory requirement for us to do so and there's nothing being approved at this point after if this planning application goes ahead we are committed to engaging with the residents up to the point where delivery works would begin and uh, constant contact would be made the proposed development the objection was that proposed development should not be at the entrance of the Darbo village and again, just to reiterate, this is a, a, a location that was provided to us by the landowner, and it was not one that we had specifically handpicked. But it is worth noting that the existing substation is actually 300 metres closer to the village than the proposed development area. We were told that the substation is a concerted effort to remove potential green space. We do prioritise the electrical reliability and the continuous supply as fundamental and crucial to the well-being of the residents within the Darbo community. And although the proposed redevelopment is, in a, is within a greenfield site, there is still ample space within the land for sustainable recreational activities. This was taken into consideration during the design phase and concluded in the decision to position the new substation in the far eastern corner of the land and the existing footprint will also be returned to the present landowner. We were told that the proposed development will exacerbate surface water flooding. The proposed development is a free draining site, we, which removes surface water runoff, so we cannot see how it would exacerbate the existing issues if there is any. A flood survey of the site has been undertaken, and the site is considered to be at little to no risk from flooding from various sources such as fluvial coastal, surface water or infrastructure. And it's also during within that um, consultation, it's been recommended that appropriate design surface water drain schemes are implemented with exceeding flow paths that run that route run off away from the site and we have made provisions for this we've got underground drainage in the form of soca ways installed to mitigate this issue and we will be building the the foundation of the site such that it actually sits above the the anticipated flood level the noise generated from the substation is is uh, considered a real problem with with the residents which we appreciate Hence why we've had noise assessments done from the site, which has spanned over several days with different types of equipment that the consultant has used. And that's included in us installing this noise barrier to be installed around parts of this perimeter to ensure that the dispersion is confined to within the proposed development area. 
the transformer to be installed is also of the lowest capacity model that we install on the electrical network at this voltage level and to be ensure that any noise to ensure that any noise produced is minimal. The position of the barriers has been determined from the consultant and this assessment was submitted as part of the application documentation and they concluded that the proposed development would have negligible adverse impact in terms of noise as long as the recommended mitigation measures are put in place. Now we've also done for our transformer that we're going to be installing, we've done a factory acceptance test of that and we also within our own design policies and specifications have a minimum noise level requirement that we have to meet. The factory te acceptance test results show that it's actually even below that minimum threshold. So we have got a threshold of 80 decibels and the, and the maximum noise that's going to come out from the transformer at any point will be 77. Now that's only when the transformer is going to be taking quite a lot of load. Now this is a 10 MVA or 10 megawatt transformer that's going to be installed. Right now Darvo only requires one. So we're only going to be using 10% of its capacity and only when fans and pumps are having to be um, um, initiated as a result of high load would the would noise start to actually ramp up. But even with that in mind, the noise barriers would, would mitigate that issue. One of the objections was that Nature Scott should be consulted because the development would remove woodland and habitat. We have done a, a thorough environmental impact assessment during the design phase and all existing natural habitat should be maintained as far as possible. On based on our proposals, no wildlife or existing species are going to be disturbed during construction and prior to any construction work commencing, we will be completing a pre-commencement ecology survey to ascertain if any wildlife or even any new species have, vest, have nested within the vicinity. And we've obviously outlined in our proposals, made the effort to improve and enhance biodiversity within the site as a result of, a, as a consequence of us having to do the construction works. The objection was made that the change in green space, green space to a developed area will affect the local environment. It's not our, really our intention to adversely impact the environment as we deem the safe and constant supply of electricity paramount to the well-being of the residents within Darville. As with any type of development, ground construction works are essential and, and required and assurances have and will continue to be provided with respect to compensatory tree and vegetation planting. The final thing I want to say is that the representative is concerned that the redevelopment, the, the objection was made, sorry, that the representative is concerned that the redevelopment of the existing site will be further for further housing and Darbo doesn't seem to have the infrastructure in place for the development for specifying that schools and nurseries are already at capacity. So with regards to the landowner's intentions, SP Energy Networks, we, we can and we won't influence or participate with any decisions or proposals that the existing landowner wishes to undertake within this existing site area and any proposals the landowner makes will require planning consent from the from at the discretion of the council and we will have no involvement in this. That's really the end of what I have to say. I'm going to take any questions that are. Yeah. Thank you. Very, thank you very much Mr Ahmed. So at this point I'm going to open up for questions. Can I ask the first one? Thanks. Sure. So in July 20, since July 2022, Davos has been on a contingency supply. Yes. I'm not a, an electrical expert, so I just wonder if you could explain what that means and is there, is there any potential supply threat to Davos at this time? Well, what that means is that we've got a, basically we've got an 11 kV, 11,000 volt network which sits on Basically, you've got one main supply that comes into an area and then you'll have a, an interconnected supply as well, meaning that if the main supply goes off, there's like a backfed supply from another area or a different circuit, which kind of keeps everything going. If that was to then go, there would be a lot more more problems, hence why the need for us to, to, to redevelop the site and get the main supply back working again, because it's always in our interest to have the main supply and a contingency or a backfed supply in the in the event of any unexpected loss. Thanks. Thanks for explaining that to me. Members? Yep. Councillor McGee. Hi there, thanks. Just regarding the noise impact assessment, again, is it, did you say it was 77 decibels? Correct. Again, look, 77, 70 decibels is loud. Again, that's like a, a hoover. Mm -hmm. Again, so if there was a hoover running at one o'clock in the morning, Folk could probably hear that. Correct, yeah, they would. So is the five decibel excess, is that five decibels over and above 77? No, that's the maximum that was achieved from, but again, that 77 comes when the, the transformer has been pushed to its full capacity, uh -huh. which we're only using 10% of even at the maximum amount that Darvo currently requires. All right, so what would the noise level be then at its natural level? It suggested natural 10% work. What would the, the decibels be then? 
Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I need to check the noise assessment report, but it'll be way below that. Well below that. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Yep. Councillor Maitland. Hey, thank you. Uh, you said that you're building to a 10% capacity mm -hmm. and you will be using 10%. So why, why, we, why are you building <laughs> so so large if you're only going to use a tenth of it? Do you have plans to use it in the future? Well, it's to be using 10 MBA is the is the minimum that we have, you know, contractually agreed with our suppliers. That that's what we provide on the network. There is obviously scope to expand on that in the future if required, if there want to be more developments within Darvo, if there need to be an uptake of electric vehicles. So we have taken that into consideration as well. So we are kind of planning for the future because the lifespan of the substation will be for up to 40 to 50 years. So again, it's to make provisions for that and to kind of cause any continuous disruptions to any any further installations for quite some time. Councillor Lennox. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, the perception I'm getting is that the the site has been chosen to accommodate the landowner as opposed to any material consideration. Would uh, was it considered um, to utilise the existing substation uh, before selecting a new site? Yeah, of course. That was obviously the 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 first intention would be to try and maintain an existing footprint if we can. However, because of our now in place design policies from before many years ago back in the, the 60s and things like that when the substation was first installed these policies were not in place but they are now and that's why we don't want we don't have the available space at the existing site and based on where the where the river is and the water course we just wouldn't be able to do it so hence why we've chosen the other side of the the land which is we consider kind of trying to cause the least disruption to that site as a whole we don't want to put it in the center we don't really want to put it in the kind of line of sight with as, as little people as possible. Again, that's why we've got the screening implementations in place as well. Yeah, Councillor Filson. Uh, well, can I ask uh, why you haven't engaged with Mr Brown, uh, the most impacted resident, and, and to come to a site where he could actually hear what the, the substation you're proposing will sound like? We haven't engaged with anybody from the community at the moment, merely because we're we're still under this this um, proposal still under consideration. So at which point, if there is if this does get approved, we've got absolutely no problems in allowing or explaining to to anyone or, or giving an example of what the kind of noise that's emitted from transformers. Yeah, Councillor Wilson. Yeah, any other questions? No. Councillor Maven. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you tell us how you will connect to the grid? Is this overhead pylons or is this a, an underground cable or is, is it a spur from the old mm -hmm. substation that, that exists just now? All underground cabling for the for this connection and all underground cabling will be done on the inside of the on, on the inside of the hedge so that we're again going to be trying to cause as least disruption to the road dig ups as possible. Time some again. Just one further question regarding the we've got tree planting to the one side mm -hmm. of the construction. Uh, is there any reason why we couldn't have planted it on the opposite side of that? Or is that some use that against or you would be not necessarily against? I think again putting the thirty trees on the other side, we knew that to that side of the substation there wouldn't be any more further development taking place. So again, it was a, a more appropriate space for us to put the trees on that side. Had we put it again on the opposite side, that would, that would potentially uh, um, not really make that site possible, that part of the land possible for any further developments that someone want to undertake. Members, anything else for Mr Ahmed? No. Oh, thank you very right. much, Mr Ahmed. If you just return to the... The public gallery. Members, at this point, that's the, the, the hearing closed. So um, I'm going to ask the planning department then to respond to the points raised during the hearing. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'll just run through a few of the points, not necessarily cover everything, um, but some of the kind of key elements. So um, just in respect of uh, Mr Bryson's comments, um, 
the he did refer to the acoustic barrier as being 1.8 meter high. Just to clarify, it's actually three meter high, but there is a a reference error in paragraph 40 where we do say 1.8 meter high at that point, but there's another two or three references in there to three meters. So there is one error at 1.8, but to clarify the acoustic barrier is three meters high. Um, and it, it does only form a, pro, a portion of the site boundary. Um, that's informed by the noise impact assessment and the recommendations there, um, because the only potential noise exceedance at the absolute worst case scenario for um, that site was uh, towards the property across the road there. So that's why the acoustic barrier is in that location uh, to make sure that the mitigation um, is specific to the property that might have the impact. Um, subject to that mitigation, um, just to clarify, um, the noise impact assessment uh, makes it clear that um, all relevant standards are met and environmental health are comfortable with that um, and that there should be no unacceptable impact. Um, just to reiterate on flooding, um, it's it's not high risk SEPA and ARA flooding. Um, both raise no objections to it. Flooding is an important matter in policy um, and it's not an easy matter to try and address. So um, it has got a clean bill of health in, in respect to flooding. So there's, there's no expected flood impact. Um, road safety, um, sure uh, Barry uh, would be able to speak on this, um, but the, the site um, does have a no objections from ARA and it can be controlled via condition um, for the construction traffic management stage. Um, whilst it's in operation, um, impacts and um, use of that uh, site would be pretty minimal. It would just be occasional maintenance. So um, any risk there, I would expect to be very small um, and the junction meets the relevant standards. Um, just to clarify that property values um, are not material considerations. Um, I do understand it's obviously an emotive issue for people, but it's not something that we can take account of in the planning decision. Um, in respect to health concerns, um, there's nothing in, in government guidance to suggest that there's any health impacts um, from substations. They, they do currently exist in close proximity to residential properties across the country, um, and it's, it's not an uncommon um, situation. So. There's, there's no um, impact um, understood to, to take place. Um, the use of the ground, I think it was described as a park. I, mean, I think it's probably more an agricultural field that may be used for access. Um, access generally to that larger area is still maintained for anyone that wants to walk through the field um, as a small part of the, the larger site. Um, the, Mr Bryson also raised um, just a point about alternatives. Um, the reason that the alternatives appeared in the applicant's supporting statement is because council officers asked the applicant for a bit of details of how they had come to their site selection. Um, they had looked at a handful of different sites um, and discounted them for various reasons as they thought that this was the best site that they were able to achieve. Um, and just to slightly jump on to to a point covered by the applicant in terms of it being landowner driven. Um, clearly, the accessibility to um, land that a landowner is prepared to either lease or sell to you is a relevant consideration um, for any developer in trying to develop a site. So um, they have looked at a number of sites, um, discounted others, and this is the one that's obviously the most favourable. So that in itself is not um, an unacceptable reason um, to, to look at this site. Um, points made by Mr Ringland, I think, largely similar um, in respect to flooding and, and traffic risks, so I've already covered them there. So in respect to Mr Carr, um, Mr Carr did object um, and does reference um, the community council within it um, that he's the chair and it was going to be dis uh, discussed at a meeting, um, but no formal um, representation um, has been made by the community council. So just to clarify that we don't have um, a formal community council position, um, but we obviously do have Mr Kerr's um, own objection and, and you've heard from him. Um, he also referred to an application in 2006. Um, I don't have the specific details of it, but it was in 2006, um, a substantial time ago. Um, it was withdrawn, so there was never actually a decision made on it. The applicant withdrew that application before any decision. So um, that application um, has absolutely no bearing on this application, and hence why we've, we've noted in the report that there's no relevant material uh, planning history for the site, um, for this development. Um, and you know, obviously the applicant did run through the, the various points um, as well, I'll, I'll not reiterate them. Um, generally, most of that is, is as we find ourselves. Um, 
the applicant gave a bit of an explanation on noise. Um, we would generally concur. Um, the noise assessment is based on an absolute worst case scenario, um, which is how you would undertake a noise assessment. Um, it's, I think it's from my understanding of the report, it's a, a fairly rare process. Um, and um, in terms of the impacts from it, it's not, it still maintains levels within houses. Um, during all times um, without the acoustic barrier, but it would potentially breach um, relevant uh, guidance external to properties. And but with the acoustic barrier, um, it, even at that absolute worst case scenario, it would maintain relevant standards. So um, it is just to reiterate that as an absolute worst case scenario and the acoustic barrier covers that off in our opinion and environmental health are comfortable with that. So happy to answer any other specific questions that members might have. Thanks, David. Before that, open that up to members for questions. I'd like to bring uh, our, our colleague Barry in to maybe discuss some of the points that was raised around the kind of speeding and traffic issues. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, I would just re reiterate the comments in relation to the, the application itself. And there was, there was um, based on the details and based on the fact that the sight lines that are achievable within the, the, the 30 mile per hour speed, speed limit that applies to the road, we had no grounds for objection, but I certainly hear the comments made in relation um, to the road safety issues, and that's something that we'll follow up on. Um, we'll under undertake a review of the existing measures that apply to the road. Um, we can carry out some surveys just to see, you know, to what extent there is a speeding issue, um, liaise with the police, etc. And um, if there are, you know, issues that need to be addressed, then we'll certainly consider. Um, what additional measures we, we can apply to that stretch of the road um, to try and get the traffic to comply with the existing speed limit. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. OK, members, I'm going to open it up to you, yourselves for any questions for the planning. Oh, Councillor McGee. Just a, a first question, Chair, regarding uh, Barry's comments here. Uh, if the if there was found to be a speeding issue on that particular road, could we uh, build a condition in just now? That would, because it sounded like the applicant was 100% supportive of any mitigation. So I was wondering if we could build something in. I know if it's not already built in, but something could take place. Uh, because only thing that helps to reduce speed uh, we don't need to find out that they're speeding first. We could just put something in to mitigate it in the first place. Thank you. Let's bring David in to answer that. Thanks, Chair. Um, I would suggest that it's probably not something that would meet the test in the circular. It's not this development that causes any speeding um, and not this development that should have to address that. I would suggest that's more a general council commitment um, as a roads authority. Um, and it's not one that I think I would support a condition on. Um, I think it, it wouldn't meet those tests and it's not a result of this development if there is any speeding issues. Um, but now that they've been brought to your attention, um, obviously the Councillor's Roads Authority should be able to look at that, which I think is what Barry's suggesting. Thanks, David. Yep. Councillor Maitland. Thank you, Chair. It's uh, David, it's a question regarding the acoustic fence thing. Um, is there any way that over time that something could be grown naturally in front of this acoustic barrier? Do you know? Because, I mean, they're, they're making effort in other areas, but it seems, we, I know we can't instantly grow trees, but if uh, there was something we could um, condition to put in front of that. If there's space. I don't know if there's actually space. Thank you. Yeah, there's a hedge plant uh, suggested to be planted round about um, the all the, the, the site, with the exception of the kind of northern, the immediate front of the northern side. But we have the existing hedging at the very front of the site and they are proposing to thicken that. So it already forms part of the, the proposals. Um, there is hedge planting to get round about. Um, the western, southern and eastern um, immediate fence boundary and then they'll thicken the, the existing hedge at the front of the site, um, which is the field boundary hedge. Um, so there will 
be some um, screening of it. And then obviously on the eastern side, we have the tree planting as well, um, which is on the side of the, the acoustic barriers. So um, there is already elements within the, the proposals, I think, that, that should over time help to screen it. Um, it will take a wee bit of time because the barriers are three metres high. Um, but over time, as things the hedges stick and establish and the trees establish, um, I think that should be um, a less uh, obvious feature. You want to come back in? Yeah, just quickly. Um, you're not going to get a three metre high hedge. David, so I was just I think that's why I was looking more towards the the tree planting side of it could that could be accommodated within it. Um, it's a green fence, you know, it's a green industrial fence. I'm just wondering if there's something we can do to soften it as there's efforts being made elsewhere on the site. Thanks. Um, we can certainly look at it through the landscaping <laughs> details to see how closely we can get the trees to the site. Um, in terms of the the kind of green colour. Um, that softens it slightly. Um, that we did have a discussion uh, with um, the applicant about um, a different kind of um, material uh, and a different style of fencing. Um, but in terms of their standards um, for the electricity infrastructure, they had certain uh, requirements that they had to bring forward. So um, the green uh, painted fencing was a, a, a compromise position to soften it. Um, the hedging, it, it, it probably won't get to the height of the acoustic barrier, um, but the acoustic barrier itself is not a, a, a metal fence and it's a more substantial solid um, structure. Um, in terms of the tree planting, we can obviously look to bring them as close as possible as well, um, but I'm conscious, I'm sure the applicant does also have um, restrictions about how close they can plant trees to their, their essential infrastructure. So um, it is something we can take away and work with them through the conditions to try and factor that in and get the trees as close as they reasonably can to to reduce that impact but it, it it won't fully screen it i wouldn't think but we'd hopefully soften it so we're happy to take that away and speak to the applicant through the, the existing conditions if you're okay with that don't see any further questions no council mcgee just a question is regarding snow asking for a condition, but I wonder if it might be possible that the planning committee get informed of the results of only traffic speed surveys eh, done on that road just for a matter of interest. Because now can it's been raised can if you're not a councillor for that particular area, that might be something that passes you by and it might be of interest to the committee. Eh, was there in fact speeding along that road? And uh, does it need to be mitigated? Thank you. Yep. Well, well, uh, we'll take that away and have a look at it. Uh, maybe it's something that we could incorporate into some training on that. I know that we've talked about doing some training in the future, so we could incorporate that within a sort of roads and training and um, talk about sort of speeding traffic and how um, sort of the planning process could be involved in that, whether it is through the, um, um, you know, speed humps or whatever on that. So, um, yeah, it's something that we can speak to um, head of road and um, come back with something on that, probably in a, a more informal um, context rather than the formality of the planning committee. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Councillor Maven. Thank you, Chair. Um, a, a question first and then, then just a comment. Um, my, my question is about the construction phase. How long would it take to build and complete this from start to finish and would a uh, lane of the road required to be closed temporarily while they do the construction and bring materials in. Um, comment is on the noise, we're talking about 77 decibels. Um, it might be useful for us planning people in the future to get an, an idea of what 77 decibels and above sounds like at various ranges. I know that um, for hearing protection, you're not required to wear hearing protection until you get up about 85 or 90 decibels. Um, at 77 decibels, I believe you could quite easily have a face-to-face -face conversation with 77 decibels of noise going on in the background. Um, 
and the 77 decibels would only be at a maximum when they're using the site at 100% capacity, which they are saying certainly would not be the case. They are looking at 10% or possibly going up to 20% in the future. I don't think the noise is an issue in this case. Thanks, Councillor Maven. I'll bring David in to talk about the traffic management plan and the conditions. Uh, yeah, in terms of just the, the construction period, um, I don't know if we've got a detail of that exact um, time scale, but I wouldn't imagine it's more than a handful of months. It's not a particularly large or complex site. Um, so hopefully not uh, it's anything contrary to what the applicant would think, but I would anticipate no more than six months, I would have thought, to, to construct something like this. I don't know if the applicant's nodding or not, but round about that perhaps. Um, but I don't think it's going to be a long-term project, just given the scale of it. Um, in terms of any kind of um, requirements to close the road, um, we would expect that that would be fleshed out in the traffic management plan. Um, and obviously, if they do, then any, any relevant permissions um, required from ARA as well. But um, at this time, I'm, I'm not aware that they'd have to close roads. But if they did temporarily, then it would just be through normal processes. Um, but I don't anticipate it would have to be a long term. We're looking for construction traffic and so on to be kept within the site during construction uh, to manage it properly and that's what the traffic management plan should be doing. Thanks David. Councillor Maitland. Sorry Chair, I meant to do this one um, before. The If there is a noise problem after the site construction, will that be dealt with through us and environmental health and not through the developer? Thank you. Um, it, any complaints would be of environmental health, um, it would fall to their legislation um, if there was any issues. Um, we've not um, looked to control that in any way. We're, we're quite comfortable that there's a reasonable process here and, and it is highly unlikely um, to, to be an issue, but there is a route there for any un, uh, unseen issues and, and that would then be taken up uh, by environmental health with the developer if there was um, any kind of noise um, concerns. Thanks, David. Members, I don't see him do online for any further questions or comments or in the room. Now, the application is recommended for approval, I think. And I heard from Mr Ahmed that this is vital infrastructure for Darbo. It's required and I'm quite happy in the reasons why it's had to go in this location and it's had to be moved away from the river. It's, there's biodiversity mitigation visual shielding and the, the acoustic barrier to deal with the, you know, any noise issues. So I am going to move for approval of the application. Councillor Maven. Sorry, I forgot my mic. I'd be happy to second that, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Maven. Is there anybody else otherwise minded? Hey Cheryl, can you record that decision, please? Thanks, Chair. Just to confirm that this application has been approved subject to the conditions listed in the report. Thank you, Cheryl. The members, I'm going to move on to item five in the agenda, which is item six in your papers. And that is planning application number 24 oblique 0078 oblique PP. And that is erection of a steel portal horse stable Building at Meadowhead Farm, Waterside, East Ayrshire, KA36JJ by Mr Jordan Crow. And again, members, this this is a, will be a hearing. And I, again, I'll suggest that five minutes for any objectors and 15 minutes for the agent, if we're okay with that. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to ask Anne-Marie to take us I'm going to ask Fiona to take us through this presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Apologies, trying to get the mic to work. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The application is before committee today as it is a local application, which due to the planning history of the site, the Chief Planner has, Planning Officer has determined is best decided by Planning Committee. The application site is located in the Rural Protection Area to the north of East Ayrshire, approximately 150 metres from the Hearshaw Muir Public Road, which accesses then onto the A719 Public Road to the south of Waterside. Located at the property are the applicant's in existing indoor riding arena, stable block and livery stable and the applicant's living accommodation. 
Plans have been amended during the course of the application to include the private access track to the proposed stable along with the proposed upgrade to the site entrance at Hirshaw Muir Road. The application the proposal seeks planning permission for the erection of a livery stable building. The applicant has explained that the new standalone building would provide complete segregation for the applicant's existing livery business, providing stabling for 14 houses for livery clients. The existing stable livery stable building would then be retained and utilised for the applicant's own personal horses. The stable building would comprise white painted concrete block wall base course with windows inset for each stable along both sides with a green box profile cladding above. Proposed floor plan shows the interior of the stable building with the stables. I'll just do a presentation for you members to show you the proposed plans. Anne-Marie Turner, who's the case officer for the application, is going to run through the photographs thereafter. That will give you an explanation of the proposals and some visual context. So just bear with me until I get this slideshow to work. OK, everybody see that OK on the screens? So here, members, just where my cursor is, going down the screen with the red, we have the A719, which takes you from the A77 over to Galston and beyond. And here is the Hearshaw Muir Road coming off. You'll see the village of Waterside there, members, and you'll see the um, Hearshaw Muir Road as it comes up to the applicant's red line site, which takes you into the access lane into his property here. These are the applicant's plans, members, just showing you the detail um, of the proposal. You'll see the stable block there. Um, and you'll just see on this plan here in the middle that the stable block is related to how the stable block is, is positioned in relation to the existing buildings at the applicant's property. You'll also see to the north with the area in blue is how the applicant intends to widen the access and surface it to prevent deleterious material um, coming onto the Hirshaw Muir Road. And you'll see a couple of photos in a minute, members, that show you the access onto the Hirshaw Muir Road, so you'll see what we mean by um, preventing material coming onto the main road there. Uh, this is just a, a, an image, members, that as presented to us for the um, stable building itself, just so that you can see the detail on the elevational treatment, shows you the layout. As ever, members, I, I always tend to put up the local development plan map for you. Um, you can see here that the application site is just located in the middle of this circle outline and it is within the rural protection area. So here we have some photos. I'm going to pass over to Anne-Marie, who's going to put her mic on. And I'll move the photographs as we continue on with a just a short outline of what each photograph represents to you. Thanks, Fiona. <clears throat> uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the first slide you can see here is on the A719 looking south and the entrance uh, to the Hersher Muir Road is on the left hand side. Uh, this is an image looking north again on the A719 and the entrance to Hersher Muir Road is on the right hand side. And then we've just got a, a, a photograph image just showing uh, the entrance across the A719 into Hersher Muir Road. And that is an image on Hersher Muir Road looking out towards the A719 junction. Uh, we're now approaching, uh, we're on the Hersha Muir Road, approaching the entrance to Meadowhead Farm on the left hand side. Um, this, is, this image is uh, taken on Hersha Muir Road looking west and the entrance to, Hersha Muir, uh, to Meadowhead Farm is on the right hand side. Uh, this image here is the application site, it's a field. And this is another image, um, just looking across to the applicant's parking area um, and the application site is to the right of the photo. Uh, this is another image, uh, just showing the kind of parking apron up at uh, Meadowhead Farm. Again, this is another image just further along, uh, again on the parking apron and we're looking uh the right hand side here into the the application site that's another image again the application site and this is just some of the applicants buildings up at um Meadowhead farm that's just another image of some further buildings up at the farm 
Um, we've got the applicant's stables for his own personal horses. And this is an image just looking across to the applicant's uh, residential accommodation. And here are the livery stables. Uh, this is an internal image of uh, the current arrangements of the livery stables. And again, a further image of the livery stables. Uh, this here is just an image of the applicant's uh, hay barn and uh, his, his own stables for his personal horses. Uh, this is a horse walker uh, up, at, up at Medhead Farm. Uh, this is an outdoor riding arena and an indoor riding arena. Thank you. Okay, back to myself. Um, we have no objections from consultees and you'll see that outlined in your report members. Um, we consulted ARA, who are here today, and we also consulted Environmental Health. We have received 11 representations of the proposal, with three parties objecting to the application and nine parties supporting the proposal. All are outlined in the report. The objections do raise access issues, and as I've said, you, member ARA, are here today and confirm that they have no objections. The letters of support content are also noted and have been noted in the report. The primary issues to be addressed with the application are the principle of stables in the countryside, the design and positioning of the stables within the site and the impact on the rural landscape, the road safety and traffic matters, private water supply, biodiversity and nature and other matters such as planning history and letters of representation. As per the report before you, it's considered that the principle of, of horse stabling being erected on this site in the rural area is appropriate. The application is backed by a business plan and has demonstrated that there are site specific requirements. Noting the design and style of the building and its siting in relation to the other buildings within the site, proposals considered to be suitably scaled, designed and located, and therefore in keeping with the character of the rural area. The applicant has indicated a willingness to upgrade the site entrance to local road specifications. Amended plans in response to the initial consultation with ARA include the access track and entrance within the site red line site boundary to address ARA's initial objections, and ARA are now satisfied with these details. The applicant is proposing to connect to the public water supply and this proposal will not therefore adversely impact on the private water supply. The applicant has expressed an interest in providing landscaping and planting in the case, during the case officer site visit and subject to details of any scheme this could contribute to towards biodiversity improvements. The points raised in the letters of objections have been noted, however they do not raise issues of such significance that would warrant refusal of the application. And the, the points raised in the letters of support have also been noted and do carry weight in the determination of the application where they raise material planning considerations. Given the above assessment, overall the proposed stable building is sensitively located in the countryside. The stables in terms of their siting and design will not adversely harm the character and environmental quality of the surrounding area, in addition to the amenity of any nearby residential properties. Post development will serve an existing livery business and is an acceptable form of development within the rural area. ARA, as I've said, our lo as local roads authority have raised no objections on road and traffic safety grounds. The application is considered to be in accordance with the relevant policies of the, of the development plan comprising the East Ayrshire Local Development Plan 2 and National Planning Framework 4. And there are no material considerations that would result in a recommendation of refusal. Back to yourself, Chair. Thank you, Fiona. Members, at this point in the, the hearing procedure, we're going to hear from the objectors and the applicant. So I'm going to ask Mr. Neil Campbell to call. Mr. Campbell, again, is the same as the last hearing, it'll be five minutes, but I'll be gentle reminder at four just to let you sum up. Mr Chairman, thank you. Uh, my name is Neil Campbell and I've lived at Hirsham Muir for nearly 45 years. The road was the original state road, which was adopted in 1966. I know it like the back of my hand. It's three miles long, single track, no passing places or walkable verges. When the previous owner of Meadowhead applied for consent to have a livery yard, the then East Asia Roads recommended refusal because of the dangerous exit onto A719 and to the fact that there was no passing places for commercial traffic, which under Transport Scotland guidelines required insertion of passing places every 150 metres. 
and to the fact in some cases the verges required remained in private ownership. The recommendation was overturned after applicant agreed to deliver a letter to the planning committee confirming that there would be no more than 10 horses of which four belonged to the owner and there'd be no more than one HGV journey a day. There are now more than 30 liveries with attendant owners, HGV cars, cars and horse trailers trundling up the road from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And it also operates as a busy Airbnb together with that traffic. On a similar application to be heard this morning, the animal sanctuary nearby, but now withdrawn, roads are insisting onto visible passing places. Where's the consistency? The road is dangerous because of this. It is also now a designated core path, the only accessible core path for walkers, cyclists to access the immunity network at Whiteley Hill. There are two other, but two others, but these cannot be navigated. No footpath and very soft verges. And since COVID, the immunity use of this road to the wind farm has also significantly increased. Your Ayrshire Roads made no mention or consider this in their report. Given the previous recommendations of roads, how can this, that position be tenable? Given the site has grown exponentially over 50 times without consent and make no comment. I defy anyone to feel safe exiting on today's 719. The, the, the pictures there are not consistent. I see a supporter also makes a comment on this dangerous exit. There are wholly inadequate sight lines and you have to draw past the, the, the stop sign into the carriageway before you can see the road is clear going south and a chance you will not encounter a, coming, a car coming fast over the hill from Waterside. The H, uh, roads were so previously concerned about this that HGVs extracting timber were only permitted to turn left out of this junction to avoid collisions. In the last two years, there have been two serious collisions and many near misses. And yet now the Ayrshire Roads again have made no comment on this. I would urge the committee before making any decisions reached to make a site visit and see for themselves. This is not nimbyism, even although the immunity for residents has been greatly diminished, but genuine concern that was highlighted in the local plan where it states that rural roads serving such commercial premises must be adequate and not affect the local community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Yeah. Members, do you have any questions? No, I don't think there's any questions, Boris. So thanks very much. If you just return to the figure. Yeah, I'm going to ask that Mr. Campbell is the only objector who's going to speak. So I'm now going to ask the applicant, Mr. Crow, to, to come forward. Mr. Crow, it's 15 minutes for yourself. Hi there, my name is Jordan Crow. Please excuse me, I'm recovering from a broken jaw, so if you need me to clarify, just let me know. It's an occupational hazard. Um, my partner and I bought Meadowhead in 2021, uh, which was operating as a livery yard, although not at capacity. Um, we do run an Airbnb, which is fully licensed uh, by the council. Uh, on our livery yard, we offer only full livery, so we care for your horse completely. Uh, so you come up and you ride your horse and you leave. Um, on October 25th, 2021, as a result of an objection from a neighbour, um, we had a plan enforcement officer come out to inspect our um, use. Uh, we were offering 18 stables for livery use. And Tom Dickey, and we have all the correspondence that's been submitted to the council, he liaised with Ayrshire Roads Alliance and they found that we were operating within um, within our planning um, and he did not consider ex expedient to pursue any further action on the matter and he closed the matter. So at that point we were offering 18 full livery stables. Since then we have dwindled down. Um, occasionally it might go up if an owner has an extra horse. I'll clarify that Generally, our liveries own three or four horses, 
So it's not 18, it's not, it wouldn't be 18 people. Currently, we only have four, and one of the people is, is, is two sisters, so technically it's five, but they come up in the same car. On site, we always try to make sure that everybody uses the same vet and everybody uses the same farrier to reduce traffic. Um, I can sympathise with my neighbours because if I seen an application come in with uh, planning for 14 more stables in a yard which currently has 23, I would be worried. Um, we did submit our business plan with the application, but the business plan was kept private. Um, quite rightfully, my neighbours haven't been um, informed of that. I did speak to majority of the neighbours on the road who I have great relationships with, hence why they have um, re uh, supported us. In our application, we clearly state that all livery clients will be in the new proposed barn that will keep them completely separate from our horses. We currently have horses living in the field that don't have stables. The place we came from before the ground was much better. We now find ourselves in a position that our personal horses require to be in in the, in the wetter months of the year. So just to clarify, we are reducing the number of stables that we have offered since October 2021 from 18 to 14, and it will be solely in the livery, solely in the new building. Um, I'm just going to have a quick read through uh, some of my neighbours. Uh, objections. So the first one from Neil Campbell, he says there's no restriction on numbers and intensification of use. I'm saying that my my restriction on numbers is 14 and I'm not, I have no interest in going any higher. I want my liveries completely separate from my horses. Uh, no published and justifiable business plan. Well, quite frankly, my business plan is, is, is my business, it belongs to us. But and for transparency, in the local area, the stables that we currently have are not um, large enough, they're not area enough, they are converted cow barns. In local vicinity to us, there are yards that can charge £40 more a week per stable because they have bigger and nicer stables. I couldn't get clients if I added £40 a week without this new facility. So from a business perspective, we are looking to reduce numbers but increase profitability so that we can be there for the rest of our working careers. Um, he notes that the ownership of the private access and adjacent land is not per neighbour notification. It is. Um, I have spoke to the owners of the driveway, which is three siblings, and the owners of the grass verge, and I have a private arrangement with them. Um, which leads me on to an objection from our other objector, who says, and to our knowledge, have not formally agreed to sell or otherwise allow access over their properties. Well, to our knowledge is the problem. I have private arrangements with the landowners um, and that's something that I've kept private with them. Um, they have been notified of the plan and application and I've been in conversation with them the full time. Um, I will note there was quite a few uh, pictures added in the original objection from Neil Campbell um, two of these are not. One of them was a large farm vehicle along the Hearshaw Muir Road. And there's been farms at on the Hearshaw Muir Road for hundreds of years. My farm in particular has history dating back to the 1500s. Um, although that farm vehicle that he pictured was not coming to my property. Um, we do operate at opening closing times. We don't allow people on the property before 8 or after 9 p.m unless there's a mitigating circumstance, like there's an emergency with a vet or something. Any vehicle movements out with those times are as personally, um, and I, I can't see why I'm not allowed to drive out my property at any point during the night. Um, I understand that they've said that it's not, li the original application 2003 was for a limited horse, and that's dubious. I am offering to limit it at 14, which is reduced from what I've been doing the last few years. Um, my neighbours' objections are clearly based, and quite rightfully, on road safety. And I totally understand that because there is an increased amount of traffic 
to the wind farm along our road, I am trying to reduce traffic to my business and I am improving the entrance to our property. The entrance to our property uh, specification was in correspondence with Ayrshire Roads Alliance, which the council have. We applied for what they recommended we apply for. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Crow. So at this point, we we'll open it up for questions for members. Can I just ask a, a quick question? Yeah. You said you offer the full livery facilities mm -hmm. and the clients travel to the site to ride their horse. Mm -hmm. Does that mean the only time that the horse boxes will come up is when they're delivering the horse to you or do the clients then bring horse boxes? Um, so some clients will occasionally go to a show um, or, or to to a lesson, so occasionally horse boxes or trailers will will leave the site and come back. Yeah, but they're not essential for to come and ride the horse. They bring a horse box with them. It's only if they're taking away for shows, etc. Yeah, no, um, it's only if they're. Ta uh, we don't have horses on site that aren't aren't stabled with us. So um, horse boxes coming to site are either delivering the horse to me, mm -hmm. um, or they're picking up the horse and taking it somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Members, do you have any questions for Mr. Crow? Yeah, Councillor Maitland. Mr. Crow, when was the last time you had full capacity at 14? Uh, uh, well, so full capacity, um, what we agreed with Tom Dick, it would have been 18. Mm -hmm. um, just now we're actually at 10 um, because we lost one of our clients, they bought their own property, but 18 would have been 2022 at some point. I don't know exactly. I don't see any questions online or in the room. So at this point, I, I'm going to close the hearing, Mr. Crow. So th thank you very much for thank that. You. If you return to the public gallery. Now, now we're going to bring in the planning department and our other colleagues to cover some of the points raised during the hearing. Well, just to check my mic again. Um, I don't really have an awful lot to raise. Um, what I, I think primarily the issues raised are 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 RF. So I'll maybe let Ara come back, come in, and then if need be, I'll come back in again. But just to clarify that the Airbnb property that was mentioned, um, being operated on site, doesn't actually require planning permission. So any licensing is would be through the licensing service. Um, and that Mr. Crow said that's already done, but certainly it doesn't need planning permission from us. Um, so there's nothing there for us in that respect. Um. Just to check and see if I've got anything else. I don't think I do at the moment, but um, if I need to come back in after Ara, hopefully that would be okay. Thank you. Chair, um, our, our colleagues who reviewed the application took into consideration the fact that the um, there's no impact on uh, traffic or parking um, in relation to this current application. Um, so the only concerns they had were in relation to the actual junction uh, onto the the, 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 the C-Class Road, and those concerns have been addressed by the applicant um, through the construction of the new um, access point there. Um, so all, all things considered, we had no grounds for objecting to the, the current proposal. Thank you, Barney. Okay, members. So, oh, no come back Sorry, in. just to clarify in respect of what Barry said, I thought it might be useful just to very quickly refer to the um, conditions on page 71. Um, under condition three, um, we have a condition saying that prior to the occupation of the stable building, the road access and widening and private access surface improvements as detailed on the approved plans will be undertaken in accordance with these details. So there's a timing implication there for the applicant to do that should he get consent. Um, that's the that's the roads condition that's on the on the um, that we're proposing as part of our recommendation today. There are other conditions that you see there, primarily number two, which talks about servicing from the mains water supply only, so they don't go into the private water supply, and obviously just the biodiversity enhancements and conditions four. But just given what Barry said, I thought it might be useful just to highlight that condition to you members, um, and that's condition three as proposed. Thank you, Fiona. Okay, over to you members, so and Councillor Lennox, what come in? Uh, thanks, Chair. It, it's really just an observation. Um, 
We're seeing, I think it's a recurring theme, and our Bearshire Rose Alliance colleagues will probably acknowledge this, that we're seeing more and more developments out in the, in the rural countryside, uh, which is creating increased traffic on single track roads. Um, these, these roads were designed for the horse and cart, never mind uh, anything else, like horse boxes and stuff like that. Again, I'm just I'm just making the comment and the observation that I think as an authority we need to we need to start thinking a lot more about uh, when we're approving applications or otherwise out here out in the rural areas that we need to we need to be taking into consideration uh, the increased traffic that's going to be on these single track roads. Um, I don't know. I don't know what else to say, but really, just to make that comment and make that observation. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Lennox. Yep, Councillor McGee. I just following up. It was the same. When the kind of same issue. Uh, I was just. My question was regarding uh, the issue was raised about the length of the road and the lack of passing places. I thought I seen in one of the photographs. Uh, a passing place uh, on the road, but in relation to Councillor Lennox's uh, raising that issue, are there are there sufficient passing places on the road? Not necessarily going in today with the current application. Uh, so I'm just wondering, is that an issue, and is there something that can be done about it? Thank. You. Bring in our colleagues for that. Councillor McGee, I'm not aware of the, the, the layout of the actual road itself um, as to whether there are sufficient passing places. Um, my understanding of the, the application process is that we could only base our deliberations on the impact that the application has on the existing road network. Um, my understanding is that there's, there's no significant impact, as I said, in relation to tra traffic or parking. Um, so on that basis, we we couldn't, uh, you know, form any sort of objection. You want to come back in, Councillor McGee? I no, I totally accept what uh, Barry's saying there, but just in relation to what Councillor Lennox was saying, can if we've got a single track road and there's one passing place for three miles, can is is that an issue, and is there something that can be done about it? And I'm not saying it's up to roads to do that objection, but uh, as a an increasing issue because as Gunther Lennox says, we're getting more and more of these kind of applications. Okay, then that we'll just note that and thanks. Uh, Councillor Mackay, you had your hand up there, I think. I did, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, this is this is a road that I know fairly well because it's certainly a road that I I cycle uh, up to the, the the wind farm site. Uh, and uh, if I can say, uh, if there are not uh, parking if passing places on it, I certainly cycling have felt very confident, and I have been. Uh, happy with the sight lines that I have had. If I didn't feel safe cycling on this road, it isn't one that I would cycle on. I hope that gives members some reassurances in terms of the, the actual road itself. Well, thank you for that insight, uh, Councillor Mackay. Members, any other questions? OK, but Councillor Maitland. Are we moving to determination? Sorry, that was sort of That's coming exactly in. where I was going at this point, yep. In that case, I'd like to um, recommend we approve the applications. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maitland. Yep, we've got Councillor Maitland proposing accept okay. and seconded by Councillor Friel. Is there any, anyone else otherwise minded? No. Okay, then, Chair, can you record that decision, please? Thanks, Chair. Just to confirm that this application has been approved subject to the conditions within the report. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, members, we're now moving on to item six on the agenda. And that is a planning application number 23 oblique 
Treble 05, oblique S36, and its consultation under Section 36 of the Electricity Act 1989 to construct a battery energy storage system with a storage capacity of 60 megawatts at Inchbean Farm, Treeswood Head Road, Shortleys, Kilmarnock. I can ask David to take us through that presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, the purpose of this report is to present a consultation under Section 36 of the Electricity Act for consideration by the Planning Committee. Um, the application site is located on agricultural land to the rear of Inchbean Farm, uh, south of the A77 in Kilmarnock. The development comprises a 60 megawatt battery energy storage system and comprises a range of infrastructure, including 36 containerised battery units, transformers, control room, a new access track, and for an anticipated operational period of 40 years, all as set out at paragraphs 3 to 11 of the papers. Consultation responses are set out at paragraphs 14 to 19, noting that no consultee has raised an objection, subject to the use of appropriate conditions to control various matters. Um, as this is a Section 36 application, consultation is undertaken by the Scottish Government. However, no detail of the content of these responses has been made available to the Planning Authority. Likewise, representations from third parties are directed to the Scottish Government, and at this time, final numbers and details of those objections have not been provided uh, by the Energy Consent Unit to the Council. Um, prior to moving on to the assessment, um, I'll just share some details of the development. You bear with me. So this is the site location um, and the context. Um, it's located um, just off the uh, U59 Treeswood Head Road, um, which continues to the north um, to Kilmarnock. The C53 um, road is just immediately um, to the north, um, where the road uh, splits just after the A77. The location plan showing Inchbean Farm and the associated buildings of the farm um, on the left hand side, the kind of um, solid black um, areas and uh, structures around about it. Um, this is located off the U59 Treeswood Head Road, an existing farmyard access point uh, before passing south of the buildings um, and comes round to the main part of the development site. Um, the northern leg um, of the red line that you see there as um, the site drainage outfall uh, connection for surface water drainage. This is the proposed layout plan um, showing the main body uh, of the batteries uh, across the central area of the site. Um, electrical infrastructure um, to the southeastern um, side of the uh, containerised batteries, fencing around all of the components and landscaping between um, the fencing boundary and the red line application boundary. The slide shows the location of the acoustic fence, and um, that's on the southeastern and northeastern um, sides of the development, um, and some details of the planting, which includes hedgerow, wildflower, and trees. This slide shows the general appearance of the site from two locations. Um, the upper two um, pictures uh, are from viewpoint three, which is just to the south of the site near Inchbean Cottage. Um, partially visible through vegetation. And the lower one um, is from viewpoint four, uh, taken um, about 1.5 kilometres to the southeast of the C53, um, noting the various uh, vegetation um, and the, the, the landscape um, appearance of the area. Um, some further uh, viewpoints here. Um, this uh, top uh, two is viewpoint one. It's approximately 800 metres to the southwest and in a slightly elevated um, location um, above the site, the site being outlined as a, um, a red hatched area. Um, viewpoint two um, is immediately below that um, and that's about 900 metres distance from a broadly similar location. The slide is um, viewpoint five. Um, it's around 300 metres north. Um, looking south towards the site, showing Inchbean Farm um, and the buildings on the skyline, um, with the development site to the left-hand side, um, partially uh, behind and partially visible through existing mature hedging, um, again shown um, as the, the kind of red um, dotted area. Viewpoint 6 um, is below that. Um, it's taken from within uh, Comarnock on the Treeswood Head Road at approximately 660 metres 
uh, distance um, and a slightly further back um, appearance, um, again showing the site through gaps in the hedging, um, but notable with the, the rising land um, behind backclothing the development and you can also appreciate the various electrical um, infrastructure um, that's located within that landscape associated with the, the nearby uh, Kilmarnock um, South uh, substation. This slide um, is just one for context. Uh, members will be aware of the, the, the various um, proposals um, in this area for battery energy. Um, so just uh, for awareness, uh, the Command of South uh, Bays, which is the Zenobi site, is currently under construction. Um, the Kansiskin development in the southern um, part is within South Ayrshire. Um, that has consent, but has not yet commenced development. Um, the Brayhead development um, that was presented to this committee in June um, and to which the council agreed to raise no objection, subject to conditions in a legal agreement. Um, and finally, for context, low dollars um, is located there too. That's been subject to an EIA screening, but no further process or application has come forward. Um, so we would not be expecting any applications for that anytime soon. Um, the standard slide in terms of the LDP2 um, extract, um, it just shows the general location um, of the site and it's located within the Rural Protection Area designation and the plan. And finally, just to um, conclude with some photographs, um, this shows the site from the public road um, south of Inchbean Farm, um, where the access track will come around the building, so it'll wrap around the buildings that you see there um, before cutting around at the back of the site to the main body um, of the site. Um, this is the um, existing access um, that's there at the moment. That um, access will be upgraded um, and then utilised for um, the application site. So it comes in there, comes across the front of those buildings and wraps round to where you've seen in the previous picture. And this photo is just um, from the access location, um, looking south and north um, along the Treeswood Head Road. And finally, and um, this is a, a photo just um, from within the main body of the site. Uh, you'll note that the um, telecoms mast um, is in the corner there. The, the development being proposed um, comes up to um, close to that, but not quite there. Um, and you see the, the mature hedging um, on the left um, and a tree belt um, on the, uh, the bottom part of the site. Um, and then to the right, but not in the picture, there's another hedge line, um, which is basically the field boundaries for uh, where the, the site is located. So I'll just turn now to the assessment. Um, just for noting, the development plan does not have primacy in Section 36 developments, but it is a useful and logical assessment tool to base our assessment against. Uh, the key matters of interest are set out from paragraphs 29 to 86, uh, noting that uh, strong and principal support for such development is gained from national and local policies. No unacceptable landscape and visual impacts are anticipated, with key visibility likely to be restricted to up to four kilometres, but with most views screened by existing buildings and vegetation even within that distance. No unacceptable impacts on the natural environment, soils, the water environment, archaeology or heritage are expected subject to planning conditions. Traffic and transport during construction is likely to be the main impact of the development. As a standalone development, whilst the proposal will bring a degree of disruption and impact during construction to those living along and using the C53, which is the main route to the site, it is considered that through mitigation measures such as approval of the construction traffic management plan, new and upgraded passing places and monitoring and enforcement thereafter, the impact from this development would not be unacceptable. Ara have included in their consultation response that they have no objection, subject to a range of conditions that can be attached to any consent granted by the Scottish Government. Although this development is relatively small in itself, it does though have the potential to add uh, cumulative construction traffic from other consented and proposed battery energy developments. Such impacts, where they not controlled, um, have the potential to raise unacceptable cumulative traffic impacts. Um, in this respect, it is proposed by the Planning Authority and ARA to adopt the same approach to the recent Brayhead development, where a controlling condition is to be attached to any consent granted by ministers to ensure that the Council has control over peak construction period vehicle movements. This is explained in greater detail at paragraphs 69 to 74 of the papers. Subject to that control, no unacceptable cumulative traffic impact is expected. 
no unacceptable impact to residential amenity is expected, noting that mitigation for noise is built into the development and has been agreed by the Council's consultants. No property is subject to significant visual impact and subject to some further control by condition to exclude HGV deliveries on a Saturday. No other construction related impact presents unacceptable uh, effects. As noted within the conclusions at paragraph 86, subject to the imposition of planning conditions in a legal agreement, the development is considered to be compliant with the development plan and other material considerations are generally supportive of the development. Legal and financial risk implications are set out at paragraphs 87 to 92, noting that the applicant will be expected to enter into a legal agreement with the council to secure a planning monitoring officer and a financial guarantee. The applicant has agreed um, to this in principle. It's noted that should the council raise an objection to development, this would likely trigger a public local inquiry and participation in such a process would be necessary. Finally, recommended condition wording and topics for which detailed condition wording will require to be agreed are set out at pages 57 to 60. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, David. I'm going to open up to members for any comments, question, Councillor Maitland. Yeah, just thank you, David. Just want to say that um, I appreciate that the council will have control over the traffic management, especially after the concerns from the the Brayhead. Um, one. However, I'm just looking at paragraph 29. I appreciate that we're a consultee on this, um, and it's um, how how we'll be making a useful contribution to renewable energy generation targets. But it doesn't help us in our generation of our targets locally. I just wanted that noted. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Lennox. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, I welcome the fact that it's recognised that, um, the, that there's a potential cumulative effect in terms of the construction, construction traffic, etc. And um, I welcome the fact that we're going to adopt similar uh, conditions associated with this application in terms of the uh, construction traffic management plan. So. Uh, to that extent, I'm I'm happy uh, that again that, that our Ayrshire Roads Alliance colleagues are, have recognised and taken cognizance of the fact um, that there were issues there in the past, and hopefully these have now been uh, or will be addressed. Um, so uh, thanks for that. Um, I think I think ongoing we need to appreciate this is just a, a well not just but it's a section 36 application. And as such, we're limited in terms of uh, the amount of what influence we have in that respect. But I think, again, I need to reiterate that we need to continue uh, to monitor uh, local concerns on the C53 uh, and as an authority, uh, take action where necessary going forward. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Lennox. Can you any comment? No, or I think it was. Yeah. Um, it, it's fair points, Councillor Linnitz, and, and we do have um, discussions with the current developer that's that's um, building their Barton Energy site. Um, they have community liaison meetings. I would say that they've fallen short a few times in terms of their communication to the residents there, um, but I certainly know that um, senior council officers have met with um, residents and, and have engaged in communications with them. So we are told about various things that are happening. Um, the planning monitoring officer is engaged on the site, um, perhaps not of comfort in terms of the residents for the impacts on the road, but the site itself is actually a very compliant one. Um, it does seem to generally be roads issues, but we're, we're fully alive to it. Um, we are in dialogue with the developer, they're in dialogue with the community, and there is a loop to close that where there's access to council officers for local uh, people as well. So um, hopefully that gives a bit of comfort. Hopefully the main issues are behind us now, um, but we'll continue to keep on top of it. Have any further questions? I don't see anybody in the room or online. And members, the recommendation is that we submit no objection subject to the comprehensive conditions that Council Lennox just can outlined there, especially around the traffic management. Are we all in agreement for approval? Yeah. Thank you.
Okay, members, we're moving on to item seven, the agenda, and that's the compliance monitor monitoring update of major developments and environmental projects. And again, it's back to yourself, David. Thanks, Chair. Um, this is the quarterly compliance report um, and provides an update on a range of large scale environmental or major developments within East Ayrshire. Um, this report covers the period from April to June 2024. Appendices 1 to 6, starting at page 79, provide the detail of each of the developments, and the report provides a summary of the main points of each development type at paragraphs 9 to 20. The key point for members to note is that no formal enforcement action has been undertaken or warranted at any of the sites during the uh, period in question. In respect to the different development types, there are no significant compliance related concerns at major developments, open cast restoration sites, single and dual turbines, quarries or landfill sites. Short summaries are set out against each of these development types in the report for completeness. In respect of electricity generating stations, the Council area currently has three wind farms under construction at North Kyle, Enoch Hill and Penclough, the latter having commenced during this quarter. One battery energy site was under construction during the quarter, with another commencing just after the reporting period, in which will be included in the next report. The main compliance related concerns on these projects during the quarter were in respect of North Kyle Wind Farm. This was raised by the site Ecological Clark of Works to the Council's Planning Monitoring Officer and Planning Authority, and related to a breakdown in communications and planning for certain works, including water crossings and ecological checks. Following a prompt meeting involving the Council, the Planning Monitoring Officer, the developer and contractors, processes have been put in place by the developer to prevent repetition, all of which is reported to be working successfully. Compliance at the site is subsequently improved, as noted by the Planning Monitoring Officer and subsequent reporting. Members will be aware that a meeting took place in May regarding the multiple battery energy storage developments located near the Commander South substation. This was in part related to previous and ongoing compliance issues at the Zenobi development and allowed community concerns to be brought forward. And the developer of that site has put in place an updated construction traffic management plan with monitoring of vehicle trips. While some ongoing roads issues occur, this is primarily being caused by lack of communication from the developer to residents. But it is noted that community engagement meetings have been stepped back up where the developer is committed to tackling ongoing concerns. Overall, however, the site is a generally compliant one and no formal action has been considered necessary during the reporting period. In terms of future compliance monitoring sites, two particular schemes are highlighted at paragraphs 22 and 23 relating to Charmerston and Dan Connor. Charmerston cannot be fully progressed until the North Kyle wind farm is complete, but will progress in due course. In relation to Dan Connor, it is noted that attempts to progress the restoration with the new site owner have not progressed well. Uh, with the council still waiting on the landowner's response to our view that the site requires restoration. Should that not be forthcoming, a potential call on the bond will be required with works thereafter potentially needed to restore the site. To conclude in this report, the recommendation is that members note the content of the report and note that no formal enforcement action has been taken or is warranted. In addition, approval is also sought to change the frequency of this report from four reports a year to two. This is explained at paragraph 25, noting that when the reporting was introduced, large scale mining and restoration were the main remit of the report. That remit is expanded to other projects, most of which are of lesser scale and risk than open cast mining. Due to the drawdown of the mining and restoration elements, it's considered that a six monthly report is more commensurate with the main types of development being reported on and also allows officer time to be focused on the monitoring itself and other work rather than contributing to the more frequently more frequent quarterly update reports. Um, thank you and I'd be happy to take any queries that you have. Okay, members are going to up for comments, questions. I've got Councillor Thanks, Chair. Uh, page 77. Uh, Paragraph 22, you could have mentioned it there, David, about the uh, Amsterdam Oak Cast restoration. Uh, and you did see there that there's no restoration will take place until North Kyle has have got their, their wind farm in place. Uh, we're hearing locally that the uh, High Greaves are looking to bring sewage sludge in to, to, for them to plant trees uh, all the way from England. I think they're doing this process in Newcomnock, I believe. I'm just wondering whether you've had any applications from a uh, Hargreaves if they're going to be doing this type of work at uh, Chamerson. Um, there's, this is a, a live matter. We've had a bit of correspondence on sewage sludge, but just to 
clarify the, the council is no part and that it doesn't need planning permission um, for it and it's done by individual landowners and it has actually for a number of years um, so I think there's sites um, near Chalmerston that have had this undertaken without any serious impact for a number of years. Um, there's some more recent um, spreading been undertaken I believe at Gurleifen and Grieve Hill which I think has been um, the, the issues locally um, for that. Um, as I said, it's it's not a matter for planning to control. We've certainly had no um, information from Hargreaves in relation to the their interest at Charmerston that they're they're going to be doing the works, but they actually wouldn't have to bring it to us anyway. So I couldn't say that they wouldn't be doing it because we're not involved in those discussions. But I'm not aware that they're looking to expand that works onto there. Um, but subject to any licences and exemptions that they need from SEPA, they could do it without our involvement anyway. It's fine, David, thanks. Have environmental health had any uh, issues over at Newcomen, where it's been happening just now? Have there been any reports there? Uh, yes, um, the, there was a number of complaints. I think a lot of people um, were under the impression that this was something that the council approved. Um, when it's not, it's a SEPA exemption, um, so we have no control over it. But there's obviously been issues, I think, of vehicles parking in Newcomen, um, and obviously with the, the content, although it's safe it's there's no harm from the material i think there is definitely a smell from it so um i believe separate to to the complaints um the area where they have been parking up in newcomnock i believe is potentially going forward for a kind of temporary site compound to do with some works that the council's doing so um it may resolve itself anyway um but um, environmental health are aware um of the issue um but if they do park on the road and if they park legally, um, there's really limited control over it. But um, hopefully, with the um, representations that have been made by the, the community, I think it's probably filtered back to to um, the landowners and uh, those doing the the works. Um, and I think you probably see driver behaviour changing, but we are aware. But technically, the council has very little control over it. That's fine, thanks very much. I do have personal knowledge of this. I used to work for High Greaves and I did actually sample the the sewage sludge. So it's absolutely putrid. <laughs> That's what I could say. Even when you're trying to bind a lorry, I think we've all done that in the past as well. So as a concern that that would be wafted right across the, the villages while that was getting done. So we'll see how it progresses. Thanks very much. Thanks, Councillor Carlson. Councillor Watts, you want to? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, on page 82 uh, of our report, um, we've got the Afton Brays Rig Road uh, by Ockenlec uh, development. Uh, so the Rig Road development. Um, I note um, that uh, we have raised issues with the developer with regard to the future maintenance uh, of the landscaped areas and the completion. Um, I am aware that there are some areas of this development that have been, in a sense, potentially finished um, within the landscaping. Um, however, looking at it, um, it certainly, in a way, hasn't been completed. Um, there are areas which are supposed to have had wildflowers um, and proper seeding uh, completed, um, and this just isn't the case. And I know that over the summer period, uh, some of these potentially finished areas um, really have been quite disgraceful in the state that they've been. So I was wondering whether we had an update uh following raising these issues with the developer uh and also what we are potentially going to do in the future to ensure that these areas are completed to the level that they are supposed to have been completed thank you jen um i don't have uh, any detailed update for you councillor um i've not been personally involved in the more recent discussions but we certainly have raised the issues with the developer and there's ongoing dialogue um about landscaping and the kind of finalized position of that and um, before the developer leaves the site as well as 
the overall site drainage um, scheme. Um, and I know that Scottish Water um, are looking at it as well and are looking to attend the site soon so that they can be fully involved in those discussions. So some areas of the site, as far as I'm aware, have been finished and have been finished in accordance with um, the approvals that were granted. Um, there are other areas that have probably not reached that stage. Um, so at this point in time, there's no planning breach because the development's not complete um, in terms of the wording um, of the conditions. Um, but we are in active dialogue with the developer about landscaping and the water drainage situation um, in there. So potentially if there are breaches of condition, if the developer won't do it or walks away, um, then that's with us as a planning authority um, to determine whether that's enforcement action that we need to take. Um, so it's it's an ongoing and live issue. Um, I can't give you the detail because I don't have the detail, but I know that those discussions are ongoing and those are the two matters for that site that are still under active consideration. So. Um, I don't think we've reached a final position yet in terms of the landscaping on exactly what will happen. Um, and that's been thrashed out at the moment. Yeah, thank you, David. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Is there any? Yep. Councillor Lennox. Thanks, Chair. It's just a general question for David uh, in terms of the unrestored open cast sites. Uh, could you tell me, David, how many unrestored open cast sites remain within the, within the authority today? A slightly loaded question, but I think we would describe it probably as one main site, which is the Charmerston site um, that's still to be restored. Um, but there are bits of other sites that are still ongoing um, and uh, elements that were perhaps a bit more to be worked on. But in terms of the the main restoration activity, I think Charmerston's the, the one that we would describe as the, the, the scheme that still needs a lot done. Um, although I'd say we've not started the wider restoration there, the, the North Kyle Wind Farm is doing consequential restoration as part of their wind farm construction. Um, and we've also started some peatland improvement works in there with some of the, the monies that we have because it was a case of maximising um, the impact for our money. Um, the contractors for the wind farm were already there and could do peat works for us for restoration. So some limited restoration work has actually taken place. And so far it's been well reported on that it's been very good, but the wider restoration is still to come on that site. So uh, in terms of the big picture, one really. Um... Hey members, is there any other questions? I don't see anybody online or in the room. I can just take you to the, the recommendations. Now, I'm going to take this in two parts, David, because part of the recommendations for noting, and you'll notice, and David mentioned it, was for us to agree that the report was presented to the Planning Committee on a six monthly basis. Now, I just, I just seek confirmation that this committee could, if there was a hot topic or a, 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 a subject, that we could ask for more frequent updates over and above the six months rather than. Yeah, that, that's always open if it is, whether it's erased informally or whether it's done formally. Um, we certainly can put um, a report to the planning committee if any issue comes up that can't actually wait to the six monthly um, time for the report to come back to planning committee. I would agree with that, Chair. That was a good idea. Thank you very much. So, can I take the recommendation? I'd be happy to note the that there's the compliance status and there's no formal enforcement. Yep. And we're in agreement that the planning committee will receive these reports on a six monthly basis from now on. Yep. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the, the final item in the agenda, and that's item number eight, and it's update report and progress of planning applications which have been recommended for approval, which are subject to the conclusion of an appropriate legal agreement and or a legacy planning applications in East Ayrshire. And David again. Thanks, Chair. Um, this report, again, it's a quarterly report on progress with applications subject to a legal agreement and legacy planning applications. Um, the report, again, covers the period April to June 2024. Um, in summary, for this quarter, paragraphs 7 and 8 in Appendix Table 1 show that there are eight applications awaiting conclusion of a legal agreement which is the same number as the last quarter. 
uh, albeit two applications were concluded in the last quarter, um, but two new applications requiring legal agreement have been added in this quarter. Um, in respect of legacy applications, paragraphs 9 to 11 in Appendix Table 2 show that there are 18 legacy applications, uh, which is two more than the last reporting quarter. Three legacy applications were cleared um, in the quarter, with five new legacy cases being added. Um, many of these applications are under processing agreements, which project manages the application uh, to revise timescales, and most applications are progressing well. Um, members are therefore asked to note the content of the report and the actions on each application set out in the tables, which is essentially to allow continued progress on each legacy and legal agreement application. Furthermore, members are asked to agree that the frequency of this report be decreased um, from three monthly to six monthly reporting periods going forward. Similar to compliance reporting, quarterly reporting takes significant officer time in preparation of the reports, and it's frequently found that updates on this frequency have very similar content over what is a relatively short period. By moving to longer periods, true stalled applications or other problematic cases can be more easily identified and highlighted in the report and addressed in greater detail. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, David. Members, any questions on the report? No. So be happy to note the contents of the report and agree the, the shift to the six monthly reporting. Yep. All in agreement. Okay, then. That concludes today's business. Thank you very much for attending. And safe journey home. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.